Hey, die Baby, ab nächstes K2 in. Hello, everybody. I want to talk about the war on diversity. And what, what I mean by that is something I, I think that may have began, well, who knows when it began, but when I first encountered this idea, it was, it was called PC. And um, now I'm seeing something that is like a resurgence of PC, and perhaps in the, in the name of, in the name of uh, protecting people, protecting feelings, maybe even guarding against a spread of uh, anti-diversity. So here we, here, here we have people who really care, I think, about people, and they really, they value diversity. They value all the differences that we have. And yet, as they value these differences, they are encouraging us to <clears throat> destroy the differences, <laughs> to become more alike, to become more equal. And so this word equal has become a way of supporting this diversity movement that is destroying diversity. And I think we see that, you know, in, one, in one way we see that I, uh, is in the, what's called, what I call the social justice warrior, who's the person going around saying, hey, um, if you're white, then you need to apologize. You need to acknowledge that you had it easier and be, because of your skin color. And, and I've heard some really great arguments um, in favor of this, supporting this idea. Yet at the same time, for me, it always comes down to, hey, um, how could you know what I've gone through in my life? How could you know what I've contributed, what pains and hardships I've gone through? Um, and, and yet you're judging me by my skin color, and you're not calling that racism. In fact, you're, you're calling it the opposite. So um, I'm a little bit confused by that, but I, I think I get where they're coming from. And right here, I'd like to pause and see what anybody here thinks about this idea. If you've seen it happening, and yeah, what do you think about it? Do you really see where they're coming from? Because <laughs> I personally have, uh, I, I definitely hear where you're, where you're coming from with that, but like, I don't know, there, what, what, is, what is your perspective on, on how they could rationalize what is judging somebody based on their skin color as anything other than racism? I mean, it seems like it's sort of kind of dry. I mean, do you have anything to think about that? Or? You want to answer that again? Yeah. I, I've got an answer to that. I, guess. Um, I think the way I understand the idea of, like, white privilege, and I don't think it's something that you need to apologize for, is not necessarily saying that, like, you're white, so therefore you have an easy life. Some people do say that, but I don't think that's the fundamental idea behind it. I think it's, like... All things being equal, a it's, bonus. It's easy, yeah. It's a bonus. It's easier to be white than to be black in this country, and or you know any other race. I don't know, but um, it's like given whatever experiences that you had, had you been not white, it would have been more difficult. I think is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. I would uh, well, if I could chime in again <laughs> uh, in response to that. Yeah, I would say that you know depending on on what group that you're raised in, you would would obviously have benefits and, and uh, advantages in that group that wouldn't be available to someone outside of that group. So by, you know, having a, a broken down like the white privilege, well, let's say I want to like move to Hong Kong. I mean, like I'm, I'm going to be the odd man out. I mean, there's, there's obviously privilege in from Hong Kong. I mean, it seems like uh, the concept is, I'm kind of interested because you said that you, you, you see where they're coming from with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like what, what did you see from that? Well, before I say, before I answer that, um, and, and so maybe because you, you just gave me an idea, maybe we should call people out on handsome privilege yeah. or tallness privilege or um, great bone structure <laughs> privilege. Um, it seems that we all have some kind of privilege, right? 
But I, I'm, I'm actually with Katie on that as far as the bonus thing, and that's that's what I would have said as far as like, and, and that's what I've heard some of the more you know, eloquent social justice warriors say is, hey, you have this extra bonus because you're white, and no matter what you went through, that's always there. And as a person of color, I could have never had that. Um, so I always had, so yeah, so for, as a person of color, I had this, um, whatever opposite of a bonus is, this um, impediment, this handicap. Uh, and to me, that makes a certain kind of sense. I don't agree with it. Uh, I don't think it makes full sense, um, but I can understand it. And yet, to me, it leads to a victim, you know, for lack of, I'm going to use the cliche, victim mentality, uh, rather than an empowerment and I tend to prefer empowerment. Any other questions on that topic? Can I reflect what, what I'm kind of, what I'm hearing, like in terms of voluntarism? Mm -hmm. So are you saying uh, you're, you're getting to the, you don't like to be coerced or uh, guilted into doing anything or Regardless of history or what other people have done, or or really for any reason, you think it's kind of unhealthy, and this is an example where people say, "Hey, you're white, and uh, for thousands of years, and and so it's you think it's you're experiencing it as like a a form of coercion or manipulation." Well, I think it's becoming that. I, I'm hearing about it uh, becoming a thing on college campuses. And I'm seeing the same thing with what I call radical feminism, where almost identical, where they're saying, hey, because you're a male, you have the benefits of this patriarchy. And as they're saying that, they are ignoring uh, all the benefits that uh, women have. And I think we all have our pros and cons as far as what makes it easy to live. And, and, and there with the genders, I think it's pretty obvious. And where does it link into voluntarism? Well, yeah, when we allow this, it, to me, I would call it a virus that's spreading, that is um, attractive and seductive to, to many people, um, I think that then what it causes is a rift between us, and it causes uh, more violence. And because... We're looking at the others as enemies. It's calling out, it's calling us to look at them as enemies rather than, hey, differences are great and okay, and we don't need to make everybody equal. It's, you know, and we don't even need to, can we? Can we even measure? Can we assign values to this idea of like, you're this race or you're this gender? I don't think we can. And if we could, everybody would assign a different value. So how could there be any fair rule or uh, forced interaction based on this subjectivity? Right? Um, I I always thought that also I always found it a little bit dubious that they would um, say, "Oh, we just want to point this out for the sake of you accepting it." Usually, there's some motivation behind there to get to um, get a policy enacted. You see what I'm saying? So the, I always thought the white privilege movement was in order to appeal to lawmakers to put some sort of policy into effect, whether it was affirmative action of some kind, or I mean, it was there was always a motive to use force behind it. I, I never, you know, I the first thing I think I would ask somebody, okay, so what, you know, if I were to, if you were to accept, if everyone agreed that yes, let's say there is white privilege and it's unfair. What next? And I think they're very, not too, they don't want to admit it, but I think historically there's always been policy behind it. There's always been the act of law behind it to use force to transfer wealth. So, I mean, other than that, I don't, I don't see, uh, I just find out, I don't see what they're, what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, if they, they're trying to guilt people into policy, I, I understand that. Like, I understand the, the, their motive. I don't think it's right, but I understand like, okay, there's a point to it. They're trying to get something. But other than that, you take that out of the picture, like a lot of uh, anarchists will still advocate for white privilege. Like, what, what, 
what's the point? Why are you wasting my time? You know, like I, it, it, that's the first battle to find out what they really, what they're really getting at. You want my stuff or not? You know what I mean? That's what it comes down to. Does anybody want to respond to that or ask another question? Yeah, just not a direct response to that. I guess my perspective on it is I don't, I don't look at it as a guilt thing. Like the purpose is to make you feel bad if you're white and it's white privilege or if you're straight and it's straight privilege. I look at it as acknowledging the other. And I think all of us are probably minorities in some way, whether it's our political beliefs or whatever it is. And you've probably been in a situation where someone else acknowledges that they know what you've gone through, whether it's, hey, I know you had a hard time, but you didn't grow up with a lot of money. Hey, I know you've had a hard time. You, you know, It's about that acknowledging piece. And I, I think we're all one, regardless of race, sex, etc. And I think that another perspective on this is identifying our privilege can be a good thing because it brings us closer together and it's a way of saying, you know what, I may have had some advantages over you. You know what, when I walk down the street in a particular neighborhood, I don't have to go through what you go through. I recognize that that's a tough thing. And I'm totally on board with my man over there who says we need to be skeptical of this because it can be used to manipulate us and you know make us like policies that aren't in our best favor, that aren't in our best uh, interest, I get that, but at the same time, I don't have such a skeptical view of the idea of white privilege because um, I look at it as a way to bring us closer and recognize the shit that we've all gone through because every race, whether it's Native Americans, African Americans, Jewish people, whatever, we've all had shitty things happen to us, often by the government, by the way, but we've, we've all had shitty things happen to us in this way of saying, you know what, you've gone through something that I haven't had to go through, I bow, I acknowledge that. So. I look at it as it could be a positive thing, although we do need to be skeptical of it. Um, so, the idea of um, social justice warrior, um, that's a concept that I've been thinking about um, a lot lately. And um, I actually am kind of working on building a comedy routine. And one of the things that I talk about is all the people that I don't like. And I talk about how I really, really get angry at hate groups, which I kind of think is... And it, it's like, oh, you, you hate hate groups. Um, that, doesn't that put you in a hate group if you hate a hate group? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel, uh, I feel that that's something that's troubling you. Like, I could be off base, but that's what troubles me is seeing, seeing people get angry at other people that make them angry. Mm -hmm. And that just seems like kind of a, a vicious cycle to get wrapped into. Mm -hmm. um, I saw uh, recently, and some people here might disagree with me on this, and I, you know, I, I don't have, know enough about the Confederate flag to, to pick a side, but there was a video of a man jumping out of his car and running to a man's truck, another man's truck, and ripping this Confederate flag off of his truck. And somebody's like, oh, this guy's the guy who's ripping the, the other man's truck apart is a hero. And, uh, and I'm like, well, so... Um, the guy's destroying another man's property because the, that property is upsetting him. Uh, now, I would love to live, work in, live in an environment where, hey, I respect that this, is, this troubles you. Let's have a conversation about it and feel, see if I can put up some other symbol of my, of my heritage that doesn't offend you and doesn't trouble you. With, but it, in the end, it's like um, it's breaking of the law in... Granted, laws have changed based on what we consider socially uh, essential, but just the idea of getting angry and using hate against a hate group kind of throws you into the same boiling pot. And I, as far as, as, as privilege, hey, I, I love being a guy. I, I love being white. If I was black, I'd probably love being black too. But I tell you what, I have, you know how many periods I've had in my entire life? Like none. And that, I like that fact. I mean, that's a privilege, but, so I am willing, on one hand, I am willing to accept the fact that, that there are certain advantages and privileges I have. Uh, at the same time, I don't know that hate is the appropriate response to, to express your displeasure of a hate group. I don't know if that's in line with that view. Oh yeah, so Daniel, I have a question. I'll respond to that. Um, so this is 
part of the war on discrimination um, that it, I think is also sort of interesting. And it's this, um, hey, that display, that display is racist or something, right? And by display, I mean that symbol, that flag, that thing a person said, whatever, okay? So we must, in the interest of diversity and supporting diversity, we must destroy that. We must take it down. We must hide it. Um, yet, isn't that part of diversity, is to have thoughts that are outside of the norm, thoughts and words and displays? Um, and who's to judge, right? You should judge which ones are damaging and which are not. And even if you judge them as damaging, where do we draw the line at what is damaging? Well, that's a whole other con conversation, isn't it? Like force. What is force? Um, but I won't go there right now because there's not really time. Um, <laughs> Daniel? Well, I mostly wanted to just respond with you to what you were saying earlier, which is um, as far as what the social justice warriors are thinking when it comes to this whole privilege thing, I don't think it's what you were describing. What you, what you were describing sounds more to me like just having empathy and sympathy for your fellow human beings and just recognizing whatever kind of struggles they may have been through as an individual or as any part of a particular arbitrary group. And I, I think that the social justice warriors, I can't bend my brain in that fashion, so I don't know what they're thinking, <laughs> but I don't think it's that, because otherwise they would just call it having sympathy, call it having empathy, you know, recognizing someone else being through going through some kind of shit yeah. and having and feeling sorry for them trying to help them. I feel that I think we're talking about two different things. We're talking about social justice warriors who are the people and we're talking about privilege which is a tool that they will use to, to spread the word, etc. And I think privilege can be used in a way to shame people, to make people feel guilty, to talk down to people, etc. But I think there's also a lot of people who are using it in a positive way. Of course they're not getting the attention, you know, any group any group's message can be skewed. So for instance, I'm sure you all know by now the word activist is a dirty word, right? You call someone an activist and all of a sudden in some people's minds conjures up images of, you know, someone that's radical, aggressive, you know, etc. Not all activists are that way, right? And I would say, I would make the same argument about that there are good social justice advocates who do look at it more from an empathy lens, but they're not necessarily the ones that are on the front lines and getting the, getting the attention. It's the same thing with animal rights activists. There's a big difference between PETA and folks who are maybe just handing out flyers and saying, hey, you might want to consider how you eat your meal. You know, that's the extremist did it almost intentionally. Exactly. exactly. Also, just want to say that I think there's a big insecurity there. I certainly feel a big insecurity about having had a life that's too easy and have wanted to not have a life that's too easy. And I think for a lot of people to have that kind of an experience, especially if they want to do great things, they want to make sure that they didn't have it too easy. And when when we have an insecurity like that, it's much easier to exploit that and use it for some kind of, um, like, you can feel better about you having a, an easy life by doing X, Y, and Z. And oftentimes for this, it just happens to be like by, you know, maybe reparations or um, uh, having different laws for different genders or whatever it is. And, while other things that we don't have the insecurities for, it's much harder to pass uh, by the law. Or by judges and other people, I suppose. Nick? Yeah, man, I just think this discussion is really cool. And Absolutely. I'm glad you kind of put it out this direction. I think it's super cool to hear what everybody says about it. Um, and if I could share and kind of add to it just briefly, you know, come to think of it, I. It is, I've actually experienced kind of the same thing. And we went to a poetry slam the other day, and uh, people who were, you know, minorities usually were going up there speaking about very, you know, powerful stuff and, and their oppression. And the people who were gay, they talked about their oppression being gay. And the people who were black talked about their oppression, you know, as a, a black colored person. And it went on like that. Women talked about their oppression as a women and being dealt with so superficially and oh when the first thing they say is oh how pretty you are and talked about appearances and so on and so forth but I thought like well if I go up there and talk what in the world am I going to talk about you know I you know but but anyway like personally it almost I can feel in myself almost a a subtle rock in my shoe syndrome 
I'm like, I need to have, you know, something. Well, what's wrong with me? You know, maybe I need. But there's a quote, and it wasn't said by Nelson Mandela. I mean, it wasn't written by Nelson Mandela, but I think he said it in one of his speeches. And it was saying, uh, it's not our lot, it's not our darkness that frightens us, it's our light. Who am I to feel beautiful or talented? Actually, who are you not to be? He says, you were a child of God, and so on. And there's nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people don't feel insecure around you. And once you let your light shine forth, then you can unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And really, this is so fascinating to me because, personally, my experience of differences has been pretty much the same. That uh, our, our differences are either taken as some kind of competitive edge or privilege or disadvantage, or our differences are taken as some artificial sense of superiority or inferiority. And it makes the experience of being alive, since you're either rich or poor or black or white or strong or weak or young or old, or, you know, you're always on some end of the spectrum, it makes it very unenjoyable. It's just as if night and day are abs like inherently opposed to each other. And I think this is just an incredible discussion to bring it to life because differences do not have to be like that. And... You know, it's being strong in the lives of somebody who's weak is, is, is more than a privilege, an opportunity to do something great for somebody. Like, if life wasn't like this and nobody needed anybody anymore, like in Utopia, what a boring world. I have nothing to bring to the table anymore. Like, oh, shit, okay, I'll have a Coke, you know? Uh, so, it, so, you want to say something? Sorry. Oh, no, go, go ahead. I was just. So, um, well, I lost my train of thought, but, so maybe I'll. I want to do a quick comment on that. Oh, sure. um, so to me, that's another thing that's important, is that we are not only allowed, but encouraged to shine and to be big. And uh, I see this movement as the opposite. It's, it's saying, hey, you, you know, don't shine, because you're, you're making everybody else feel small. Uh, and I think that's sort of obviously disempowering, right? It is. Can I? I, I forgot ahead. my train of thought again. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> awesome. So, but being big or being in a position where you can do something for somebody else or you have something to offer is really like, and you can probably relate to this as a comedian, it's like a joke. Like, once you hear a joke once, I mean, yeah, it's funny once or twice, but it's not like, oh man, I got this great joke. I'm going to make sure no, nobody else gets a hold of this. You know? No, you got to share it with people. Like, when you find something funny, it's only funny, only, again, if you share it with other people in their eyes, right? You know, in their voice, when they laugh. Like, that enriches it and adds to it. It doesn't take away from it. And I think that that's really, like, a whole different approach of, of how we've got to look at our differences. That, you know what I'm saying? Like, life can be so much more if not just you use your differences and your position to get a competitive edge or as an artificial sense of superiority, ha-ha, fuck, look at me, but really as... A way to, you know what I'm saying? To, to enrich the lives of others. I mean, it's a win win, you know? Anyway, I'm going to step off my soapbox. Scott, I just wanted to ask you if you ever tried to, uh, for the sake of the experiment, just be like, yeah, yeah I got privilege. Yeah. Just, just, like, just concede, to, concede it. You know, what's, I mean, why don't you just, I mean, that, that ends it right there. I mean, like, I mean, honestly, like, I, I, I'm very, I'm a very privileged person. I have, I have a lots of privilege. Like, you wouldn't even believe how much privilege I have. I am privileged up the ass, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Seriously. But, I mean, it doesn't change anything in my life. Does it, it doesn't, it's of no consequence to, like, how I'll behave differently. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, you ever try that just for an, ex <laughs> for an exercise? I might. To see what would that happen. Sounds like try it. Exercise. And offer a hand. See what happens. Hmm. Yeah. And then say, when they say, well, see, you know, this person is not privileged, let's just say, well, it's not my problem. <laughs> see what happens then. Then you'll find out the truth. Then you'll find out whether there's force behind what they're saying. Mm -hmm. you know. Thank you. So um, I'm going to close up by offering a solution. And, I, and, and by solution, by problem, I mean this spreading virus of, hey, you need to pretend you're small, or you need to recognize that you had more of something than somebody else. Therefore, reparations, or even you owe them some empathy, or you owe them whatever. Okay, I don't want to subscribe to that, so I want to offer up 
um, what I think of as sort of an opposite of PC languaging, and it's called nonviolent communication. And it's based on a book called Nonviolent Communication. And the reason I bring this up is because NVC uh, is a, it's a, a language that embraces um, non-coercion and taking responsibility for your own feelings. So this whole triggering thing, I didn't bring up that word, but I'm assuming many of you have heard the word triggering. It's the social justice word, we'll use this word to shut people down um, or otherwise let them know that, that what was said was damaging to them in some way. Uh, I'm triggered that you mentioned that. <laughs> So fuck you. Uh, now Stephen could claim that I was triggering him. Um, that wasn't necessarily nonviolent communication just now <laughs> on my part, but I think you guys get the point. I could say whatever. I could talk about um, abortion, guts, death, um, hell, whatever, and any number of people could choose to, to get triggered. Now, in NBC, nonviolent communication, we take responsibility for our feelings and thus power. So, I, and, and there I'm just saying that I believe power and responsibility to go hand in hand. So if a person says something to me and I don't like it, I'm triggered by it, my emotions are triggered, then how am I most powerful? Am I most powerful by defending or attacking back, trying to change them, change their language? Or am I most powerful by being like recognizing where it's coming from or even guessing? Like, hey, wow, um, sounds like, you know, if they say to me something like, hey man, you're really stinky, your armpits bug me, I uh, wish you would go away. Um, or how about this? Um, I, you know, you're really, you're really boring me, so I wish you'd shut up. So there, I could be defensive, say, yeah, we suck too, or, or oh, gosh, I, I must suck. Or I could say, hey, you know, it sounds like, is it your need for um, mental stimulation not getting met? And, you know, or you really value stimulating conversation, and you're not getting it right now? So there's many ways that we can be, and that right there, that's a practice of empathy. So not only are we being um, Aikido with our words, not letting them touch us, but also we're taking responsibility and we're showing them that they can take responsibility for their issues. And we're also creating empathy. And I think every time we create empathy, we show it, anybody in earshot is going to take that on a little bit. It's going to be like, whoa. You know, even if it's in their subconscious, they're gonna be thinking a little bit more in these terms like, whoa, there's an interesting way to respond to an attack. We don't even have to see it as an attack. We can say, oh wow, you you know, you really wanted more of this kind of thing, and you're not getting it right now. So there I see is sort of a, a, a tool to use to not only build empathy, uh, deepen our relationships, but also um, spread the counter to this virus that could be a pretty bad thing if we let it continue to, to go on and on. So, any more questions? I just wonder if the whole white privilege thing is more of an issue here in the United States, or is it more like worldwide? My parents are both Jamaican, and my parents have always taught me to be really proud, you know, just, you know, be educated, speak well, you know, be knowledgeable in what you're talking about, and you'll be fine. My parents came here in the 70s, they've never had any issues whatsoever, finding jobs, they're very successful, live in great neighborhoods, drive nice cars, I mean, they're fine. They've had the same issues that any African American would have. Same thing with me, I mean, I have, I work in an environment where I have, you know, whites and blacks and Hispanics working with me and I don't have any issues getting along with them, so, I don't know. So is it an objective thing that 100% is about this culture, or is it more of like a tool that people are using just like any other tool to kind of... Uh, I mean, the thing is, is that I feel like people are born the way they are. You're born white, I'm born black, but that's pretty much the only difference between you and I. So and I there's people in my, pe there's black people that I would feel that are damaging to me. I mean, I've been called an Oreo, you know, all my life. Um, you know, and other things is because people didn't understand me, they didn't understand my, my background, you know, so. Yeah. Where is it, please? <laughs> so, in the beginning, you're asking the question: Do you, do you think this is worldwide or just the United States? 
And I'm not sure if that was rhetorical or not. I don't know the answer to that. I'm wondering if you have suspicions, ideas. Um, I didn't really get from what you just said, if you do. I guess it was more of a rhetorical question, but I just remember when I was a child, I was like 12 years old, and I remember my dad, I think we were shopping at some department store. I remember he went to look at some shoes, and there was a bunch of like white guys or whatever around him or whatever, I think it was like in the 80s, and they kind of like made a lot of room for him. <laughs> and my dad's like a big, you know, he's a big Jamaican guy. So, you know, at first I guess he looks intimidating, I don't know, but, um, what he said to me kind of like stood out in my mind. He's just like, whatever, it's of no consequence. And he just went about his business. That's it. Anyone that talks to my dad, they know he is completely like amazing. He knows a lot. I mean, my husband has learned so much from him. I mean, he pretty much is like the jack of all trades. I mean, he's just, he's just brilliant, in my opinion. So, yeah. He is powerful. And how, he has privilege. How, how, how powerful would he have been if he yeah. chose to take offense then? You know? Honestly, People will be how they are, in my opinion. If you're going to be racist against me, I mean, whatever. I mean, I, that's just how I, I, I take it. You're, that's honestly... What am I trying to say? You are... That's your disadvantage that you're, you're, you're racist and you're acting the way you are it's against me. Yeah, it's your loss, basically. It's not a personal offense. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. So if, if they don't like me, they probably don't like any black person. So whatever, you know. But I've met great people of all races, and they've been very supportive of me and kind to me. So I can't say that one race is better than another, or one group of people have treated me better than another. I've you haven't quite felt the uh, uh, not having white privilege as being a negative thing for you. You quite no, you, yeah, no. And if someone, whether you're white, black, or whatever. If someone has to struggle to get somewhere, you are going to be freaking amazing once you actually get there because of the challenges that you had. You're going to be fucking badass. That's kind of a privilege in itself right there. <laughs> struggle <laughs> privilege. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to wrap up my talk because I, I know I've like, gone over it. It sounds like, uh, looks like we have a couple more people who want to talk. Uh, Daniel? And be a meetup group. <laughs> 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 I hate to be that guy, but I feel like I'm the only one in the room that doesn't know Bond.